Place. Good morning. I'd like to call to order the Tourist Development Council meeting for January 9th, 2020. I feel like I haven't seen you guys since last year. <laughs> That's the only time I'll do it, okay? All right, uh, let's uh, stand this morning for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated, and uh, please call the roll. Here. 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 All right. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, the first item on the agenda today is approval of the December 12th minutes. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes? Okay. Motion, motion okay. from. Mr. Wells and a second from Mayor Saraceda. Did I hear that right? Yes. Okay, very good. All right, do we have any discussion on that? Do we have any objection to that? No objection, then that motion carries. Uh, at this time, we will listen to the public to be heard. Uh, does anybody wish to speak this morning? Great. And head right on up to the podium. Can't wait to hear about things at the Shell Museum. I uh, can't wait to hear about the Shell Museum. And you have to talk to somebody else. Oh, no, really? I don't know anything about the Shell Museum. <laughs> it's been three years since I've been here. I'm, I I'm, I'll, I'll get it. I'll get and the you head. haven't seen me for a while, so that's yeah. okay. Art Fest, my bad. There we go. There you go, right? There's a hint on your table. Good morning. I'm Sharon McAllister. I am the 20 year executive director and founding director of Art Fest Fort Myers. Um, it is hard to believe it is 20 years. Um, so our anniversary is in a couple weeks, in the first weekend of February. I'm here on behalf of myself, our staff, our board, our 50-member volunteer steering committee, and 500 weekend volunteers. Um, on your table is a magazine about that. Uh, we'll get back to that in a minute. I'm also here to thank you for many, many years of the TDC's support. I have, uh, think I have lost track of how many, but it is close to all 20. Um, we appreciate that and also appreciate the guidance we get from the DCB. Uh, this year we got tremendous guidance. We're going to show you a video from LA, Brian, and Nancy about the best ways to market out of market, the best ways to try to drive extra traffic on weekends and things like that, and room nights. So we appreciate both the money and the guidance and expertise that they share with us. Um, like I said, on your table is the magazine about Art Fest that just came out. It's actually uh, in other there's about 5,000 around downtown. It's got a local piece, um, but it gives you all the information you want to know. The second half of the magazine is about downtown in general. Uh, I want to show you a video. This video was produced with funding from the TDC out of our event grant. It currently resides on our website. Uh, it's on our Facebook page and other places. Uh, it's at the airport as well. Um, it tells the story so I don't have to talk. intentionally built it to build, to build on the
enjoy that in the way it, it tells the story of, of uh, that's on the home page of our website. That's the last page of the video. Um, also on your table is an envelope, card size envelope. Um, it has your VIP tickets in it. So please don't leave it behind. Those are valuable envelopes. Um, there is not one for Commissioner Hammond or for John McLean. Uh, you were not appointed yet at the time they were printed. So yours is being printed now and will be delivered to your office. Uh, and yours will be, um, will be delivered to the VCB and sent to you. Thank you. Somehow it uh, got printed incorrectly. All right. So thank you again for your support, and I hope we see you all at our fest. Thank you for coming this morning, Sharon. Thank you. All right. Does anybody else wish to be heard this morning? All right. Seeing no more, I'll close public comment. Um, municipalities to be heard this morning. Great. Good morning, everyone. Michelle Dean with the City of Cape Coral. And just have a couple of quick things today. Um, we have a milestone this year in Cape Coral. You may or may not have heard about. Um, back when Edison and Ford were how, you know, gallivanting around Fort Myers, Cape Coral was a speck on the map. It was really just a wild wilderness. Um, it started being developed in the mid-50s. And it was not incorporated in 19, until 1970, which means we're celebrating 50 years. Yay! So you may start to see some of these logos around town. Um, we have them on all of our city vehicles. Uh, we are doing a city jubilee on the 24th at the Yacht Club. Uh, we're also going to have a lit logo on the side of City Hall all year long in recognition of this milestone, which again seems very young for the city of Fort Myers. Um, but uh, we did bring, or I did bring, um, pins for each of the council. That's excellent. Take one in commemoration of our big milestone anniversary. And then I uh, also just wanted to let you all know about um, our 29th annual tour to Cape is next weekend. That's the 18th and 19th. Um, that is a 5K run on Friday. I mean, I'm sorry, on Saturday. And on Sunday, uh, bike riders have a choice of 15, 30, 62, or 100 miles. So if anybody's up for riding around Cape Coral next weekend, it's always a super fun event. It um, starts out of uh, Cape Harbor Marina and ends there with a great uh, party afterwards. So we love uh, Tory Cape. People from all over the country come. And again, we always appreciate the TDC's, TDC's support. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for coming this morning. <clears throat> all right. Anybody uh, else from municipalities to be heard? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Judy. All right. We'll close municipalities to be heard and move on to the report of the executive director. That's you. Good morning and a happy new year. Today is a big day. Uh, getting to announce uh, a 19% increase in bed tax collection for November is a happy moment for sure. Um, the best November on record. Uh, beating beating uh, the year of Irma when we had so many crews in. I, I have to admit I was a little bit surprised that that happened, but that's good news for the community for sure. Um, 2.7 million for November and then year to date just under 5 million. So remember just that's two months of the fiscal year. So tracking it at 18% increase year to date. In terms of the STAR report, um, occupancy was up 2.3%, ADR up 4.9%, and REVPAR up 7.3%. And then uh, traffic at the airport up 8.2%. Um, and and uh, for year to date for them, and this is calendar year to date, 9.1 million. Uh, through the airport up 8.7%. So we. It, uh, 19 has been uh, certainly a strong year for the airport. I need to invite Jill up, Jill Vance, to give you, and Stephanie will follow her to give you the sales report in International. Good morning, Council. I'm Jill Vance, Director of Sales, and I'll be going over our sales activities. 
So here's a recap of our first quarter results of our new fiscal, fiscal year sales goals, and we are slightly behind pace for the number of room nights from the RFPs that we have sent our hotel partners. However, we are ahead of the same time last year, so we're going in the right direction. We're also slightly behind pace for the room nights booked by our hotel partners from those RFPs. However, we are ahead of pace for the amount of domestic and international travel professionals that we have hosted here in the destination through familiarization and site tours, but we need to be ahead of pace because we don't hold FAM tours during season so we can maximize their revenues. We're also ahead of pace for the client events that we have held both domestically and internationally. And finally, we are nine leads behind pace for wedding leads sent, but we are ahead of the same time last year, so again, going in the right direction. And new this year, Jen just attended a wedding expo in our top feeder market, and she will be participating in a virtual wedding expo, which should produce more destination leads. VCB on the road. First, a big thank you to all of our industry partners who participated in our November Military Planner FAM. Candace showcased what's unique in our destination for military reunions to 10 military meeting planners. Candace already has sent uh, six leads and there are pending decisions from those planners. And here are our group sales team's activities for last quarter. Jerry attended the HPN Partner Global Partner Conference. And as some of you know, HPN is a third party with about 175 meeting planners. And what's unique about HPN is that they have their own sourcing platform, which enables hotels to respond to their leads in less than 10 minutes. This is our second year of our partnership with HPN, and we now have preferred bureau status, thanks to Jerry's efforts with this group. And Jerry will also be conducting a destination education webinar and will visit the HPN headquarters in Arizona this fiscal year. And then Erin attended, or she attended Destination Southeast, which is a hosted buyer show that includes two days of pre-scheduled one-on-one -on -one appointments with highly qualified meeting professionals who are looking specifically to book the Southeast portion of the country. And last, I'd like to point out that Betsy attended the Luxury Meetings Meeting Planner Show in New York City. This was a new show for us with qualified New York City corporate association and independent meeting planners. We've already sent four leads totaling over 3,200 room nights from this show. Here are some highlights for the consumer and travel agent team's activities. And the two photos on the right are Shelly giving presentations to travel agents in Maine and New York for client events that we co-hosted at the American Society of Travel Advisors show and the Working and Travel Trade show. Next are upcoming activities for the domestic sales team. And just to point out a couple activities for January, even as we speak, Betsy is attending the PCMA Convening Leaders Conference, which is a hosted buyer event with around 4,500 attendees and a multitude of networking opportunities. And we get great results from this event. Last year, 18 leads were sent, of which eight went to contract for our destination. Also, we'll be attending the New York Times Travel Show. We'll be in the Visit Florida booth along with two of our hotel partners. And this consumer show attracts around 23,000 serious-minded consumers looking for their next travel experience. For February, I'd just like to highlight that Betsy will be attending the Global Pharmaceutical and Medical Meeting Summit. Senior meeting management professionals from the life sciences, medical, and healthcare industries will be in attendance. This is a new show for us, of which targets, um, it's a new show for us which targets one of the vertical markets that we identified in collaboration with our economic development department here. So we're really looking forward to the, uh, to the outcome and the results. Also, I'd like to point out that Shelley will be attending the AAA Great Vacations Expo in Columbus, Ohio. This expo has become one of the largest travel shows in the United States, attracting active Ohio travelers who spend more than $1.5 billion in travel every year. And the last show I want to bring to your attention is the RCMA Emerge Conference. RCMA is the world's largest faith-based events association conference, over 400 faith-based Meeting professionals will be in attendance. And last year, Candace sent nine leads directly from this show. And finally, for March, 
New this year, Jennifer will be virtually attending the Travel Alliance Virtual Family Travel Expo. And some advantages of virtual expos is that you are able to reach a wider variety of travel agents since they don't have to travel anywhere to attend the show. And for those who are unable to attend the live dates, they can view our contact on demand for as long as a month after the expo. And also, we will receive a full database of booth visitors, including their geographical data, their annual sales, their industry membership, and also their consortia data. So we're really looking forward to the results of this show. Are there any questions before I turn over to Stephanie Zinka? Yes? Mr. Wells? On the, on the numbers where you haven't quite made your, your targets, yes, yes. what are you hearing back from people as far as what might be causing that? Uh, is it price point? Is it businesses aren't traveling as much or, or people aren't traveling as much? Well, we, we just didn't receive the same amount of leads. Um, we didn't generate the same amount. And maybe I was too aggressive with, um, with goals as far in going into an election year because I know a lot of corporate kind of hold back when they're going into an election year. But we'll see. We're, we're ahead of the same time last year. So we're, we're pacing. I'm sorry, we're pacing behind um, our goal, but we're pacing ahead of last year. So I, I'm confident we'll bounce back. Yeah, the reason I ask is because of um, we had uh, Clayton Reed in last uh, month. You know, he had anticipated a slowdown in some of that kind of travel, and I yeah. just didn't know if you're starting to see some headwinds against that or if, if, if our market's been somewhat you know, resilient in that regard. Well, it does show growth over last year, but obviously a slower growth, so... I think, you know, the other thing there is it, it isn't consistent from quarter to quarter, right? I mean, you know, just to divided that up and say for us to be on goal, we're, at this point in the quarter, we should, you know, for after the end of the first quarter, we should be here. But we all know business isn't consistent, you know, consistent quarter to quarter. So, you know, it, to be determined yet. But, um, you know, yeah, we're keeping an eye on it. And, and we may have been too aggressive. I mean, at the end of the day, we'll see. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Council. For the record, Stephanie Zinke, International Sales Manager, to give you a brief update. Um, we started the new fiscal year with seven consumer and uh, shows and events internationally, with strong presence in Canada, um, because for that month it is a very key time for travel inspiration. We also hosted our first FAM of the new fiscal year with 10 agents from Book a Bed. We partnered with Book a Bed and British Airways for this incentive FAM to select the best selling agents which, um, who had um, the highest bookings into Florida. We also this time around uh, decided to include a travel trade writer in order to leverage our outreach, not only through those 10 agents, but across all of the Ireland um, trade industry. Um, from the, com the publications called Travel Biz. You may have heard of them. Um, back in November, Pamela Johnson represented a destination at World Travel Market in London, together with our UK-based team, and conducted over 20 meetings with key trade travel accounts as well as media. As a key takeaway, um, summarized in the interest of time, is that the outlook for international um, inbound is projected to be soft during Q1 of 2020, according to the U.S. Travel Travel's Travel Trend Index, um, which is not of too much concern for us because Q1 of the calendar year is not our biggest international inbound travel season. Meanwhile, I was in Canada together with our hotel partners from Sunstream Hotels and Resort, the West End Cape Coral, and South Seas Island Resort on a five-day sales mission um, covering Toronto and Calgary, where we trained over 85 travel agents and product managers on the destination, but most importantly, on our hotel product. In Calgary, um, we engaged with over 100 WestJetters. They're also known as the WestJet agents or sales reservation staff during the takeover that we did at the headquarters in Calgary. Almost simultaneously here in the destination, we hosted three FAMs from France, Canada, and Germany, hosting a total of 22 trade professionals, as well as the Canada Weather Network. They were filming four different segments covering the destination, and these will be um, on air during live TV uh, weather reporting starting in late January across all of Canada, which with the weather that they're having, um, seeing a fishing trip and then you know going out to our islands will be very fitting and enticing. Um, in December, our team in Germany partnered with Visit Florida on the annual roadshow covering five different cities. 
On December 4th, we headed up to Orlando with six of our hotel partners for our annual receptive tour operator event. Um, we changed up a little bit this year. We did a destination-inspired paint and mingle event, and we asked our 20-plus guests to be inspired and paint a sunset um, Fort Myers Beach picture. Um, just to point out that this event is not only to update the industry on what is new here or what is to come in the destination, but also and almost equally importantly to thank them for the past business. Before we wrapped up the 2019 year and also our farming season, um, we hosted two more, one from Canada and one from the UK, highlighting wildlife and nature, including kayaking and educational beach walks and educational components. At this point, I would like to say thank you um, because this Includes, concludes our farming season for now officially. So thank you to all of the hotel partners and industry partners who support us on these fams, not only by giving us rooms, but also by allowing us to make use of your amenities and services, whether it be complimentary bikes or um, educational beach walks. All of this helps tremendously to promote the destination, but most importantly, highlight those hotels. On this last UK fan particularly, we included golf as a request from one of the tour operators. And I'd like to share one of my favorite quote from one of these attendees, and which is why, in my opinion, um, it shows the importance of doing these fans and bringing the people here. After we toured the course and we went to the Dunes Golf Course on Sanibel, she said, I have seen a lot of PGA golf courses from around the world, but I will sell this golf course particularly because of its abundant wildlife, a truly unique atmosphere. I mean, seriously, where can you golf on a PGA course and stop to see a crocodile soaking up the December sun or colorful birds and turtles crossing by the ninth hole? So she's officially converted into a destination ambassador. Um, looking ahead, in Germany, we'll be focusing our first webinar series, which we are doing in partnership with the Visit USA committees in all three German-speaking markets. The first one kicked off yesterday. In Scandinavia, we started the year with several shows, which we are attending through our partnership with the Florida Beaches Coalition. And then to finish the month of January, we will be at Florida Huddle um, to hold up to 40 um, pre-scheduled appointments with different buyers from t uh, 12 different countries. For February, we are attending a new show in Hamburg. It's a new show for us in order to expand our um, reach into the greater Hamburg area. Together with five hotel partners, we will be at Connect Travel Marketplace later the month in Kissimmee. And we are also starting our winter consumer shows in Canada with the Outdoor Adventure Show. In March, the main event is going to be ITB um, on the calendar for us in Berlin. It is the largest travel and tourism trade show by far across Europe. To maximize our efforts while we are in Berlin, we are also attending um, IMM Travel Media Marketplace this year, which is the day before ITB. So we're attacking trade and media at the same time. Are there any questions before I hand it over to Judy for her update? Okay, thank you very much. All right, Judy Durant with the Visitor Services Group. Good morning, Judy Durant, Visitor Services. So happy to see you here. On um, this slide, just note that we're actually up about our visitor outreach calendar year to date to our visitors. We're very, very happy about that. Um, lots and lots of outreach happening um, at the airport. It's very busy. Last quarter also, and this quarter is going insane, so we're very happy about that. Here you'll see our top three requests for information, as you'll note by the accommodations, attractions, and activities sections. You'll see the top three um, different categories of uh, questions asked and uh, volunteers. Just engage people in conversation, and then when they find out what they're really interested in, then they'll simply talk about the different areas and where people are going, where they're staying. Most people do arrive with accommodations, but those that don't, we have a rule of three, which essentially means we find out where they're going, what they're doing, what they're interested in, and then we'll make some recommendations on a minimum of three times, or three different uh, categories. So it's a lot of fun listening to the vol volunteers interact with the traveling public. Here you'll see some of our community and partner support. You'll hear more from um, the public relations folks later, but Roy Hobbs was a big deal for us. Um, we had 33 volunteers fielded. Hobie, we really loved working um, with, um, with Francesca and marketing and everybody to provide some volunteers to support the visitors arriving there. You've heard about the Travelability Summit. Josh Lambert on marketing and I were 
immensely impressed with working with about 150 different meeting planners, disability um, folks, bloggers, just everybody who really advocates for travel for persons with disabilities. Fort Myers tip-off, that was wonderful. We had a field of four volunteers that actually worked to provide support to the media that was arriving. Very, very helpful. And our next one, just a quick overview of some of the different types of training outreach that we provided. This past quarter, we had lots of interest from the traveling public about culture and history, entertainment, lots of people asking about what they can do with children, and of course, some of our resort properties. So we were able to visit these different locations and provide some great information. And like the others have mentioned, I do want to personally thank everyone for um, hosting our volunteers and allowing us to learn more about them. And then quickly, a look ahead. We've started our morning and evening shifts for the season. We have a 7.30 to 10 a.m. shift. Of course, our normal 10 to 2 and 2 to 6 shifts, and then our 6 to 9 shifts. Those run uh, Tuesday through Saturday through mid-April. So if you're ever out there, stop at a visitor information booth and say hello to our tourism ambassadors. They always remember you, and they always tell us that they saw one of you. So thank you. Our spring training is coming up. As you can see, we'll have volunteers working every single game there, talking about the area, what to do, where to go, where businesses are, things like that. And then, of course, please mark your calendar, though you're going to hear more later about our 30th annual Volunteer Tourism Ambassador Appreciation Luncheon. Yes, 30 years old. So we're going to make a big deal about this. It's going to be at the Hyatt on April 2nd. And then, of course, our Lee County Travel Rally on May 5th. I bet you, I bet you can guess that theme already. So. If you have no questions, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. All right. Thank Thanks, you, Judy. Judy. Now Francesca Donnellan will give us the communications report. Good morning, everyone. All right, let me get organized here. Uh, I'm going to start my presentation talking about Hobie. Can you hear me? Uh, so the Hobie World uh, Championships came here in November. Um, I hope that you knew that because we tried to make a big splash about that. It actually began, just to give you a little history, in 2016 um, when Shelley Krant made some relationships. We brought him some media here. Tam ended up having an auspicious dinner at the Tarpon Lodge with the head of Hobie, and before you know it, they came here. So it was really impressive. What made it most impressive was it was the first time in 35 years that they had come to the United States. So if you didn't know they came or you forgot about it, I want to remind you with this video. Assets like the one that you just saw, we have drone footage, photos, stills, video. Um, uh, we have so we have assets equaling almost a hundred thousand dollars that are available for everyone. Um, they had people on the ground for a month uh, documenting this event, and we've got just beautiful, beautiful footage. So the other things we got is a just a quick reminder. Some by the numbers, we had 250 teams, we had six continents. The big thing about having them here for the first time in 35 years is we wanted to put Lee County on the map internationally as well. And you can see that having 25 countries, six continents here, we were able to get a lot of media coverage all over the world. Um, another really interesting thing that happened that has never happened at a world is that uh, because of the way South Seas was located, they allowed people to come in and go on Sunset Beach. So they had fit over 1,500 spectators. So sailing sort of a, not really a spectator sport. So they were thrilled to have these spectators. And what was more interesting is that some of them bought boats. So for the first time, 65 people walking down the beach bought a $10,000 boat which is really unusual. So they were, they were really excited about that as well. 
and, and just to add a little bit to that, you know, you saw the sales. Those were custom design sales for this particular event. We worked really closely with them, so it would be reflective of our area. So that boat that they bought is that branded boat. And it's like, you know, kind of choice to have one of the world race boats. I mean, they're, they're collector's items. And so those people will keep that sale and those marks that have our name and logo on them on that boat as long as they have it. So it's a really cool thing. Yeah, it was, it was an amazing, um, amazing thing to have. And also in social, just wanted to mention 1.9 million um, impressions on uh, Facebook and we gave a ton of stuff away um, to, on our social media, like boats and little, littler boats. A boat. A boat. <laughs> <laughs> some kayaks, some Travis tumblers, you know, some, some koozies. Cozy, um, so then I want to talk about some of the numbers which were just equally as impressive. So the, the area of Starbucks right outside of South Seas was up 36% year over year in November. Sunset Beach, 319% because that's where the spectators went and bought those pricey pina coladas. <laughs> so it shows. Uh, group banquet revenue is up big triple digits and Harborside restaurant revenue. Um, Sandy Stilwell also reported that her restaurants along um, Andy Rossi were up 5%, which sounds like a small number. But the thing that we were forgetting is that this all happened during a red tide event, which makes these numbers, these historic numbers, even more impressive. I mean, they, and, and what was even better about that, not that there's anything great about a red tide event, but when you ask the sailors, do you mind the red tide? They were insulted by the question. Like, they're warriors. They're like, what's red tide? We don't care about red tide. So even when the media tried to come out and make a fuss over the red tide, the sailors really, really organically were just like, we've been in worse conditions than this. We've had tycoons, I mean typhoons, and we've had, you know, uh, sharks. Like, what's red tide? So this is the perfect audience to have a little bit of a snag. You know, they were great. We got tremendous coverage from all over the world. We got 25 million impressions. And the way I broke it out was in February, February when we announced they were coming, it was a big buzz about that. And then in November, 13 million when they were actually here. And you can see the countries reached, which was our goal was to get news about us all over the world. And then quickly moving forward, uh, recent fans, we had a uh, Sarasota freelancer, we had a German a radio uh, announcer. And then in the middle there, we had a writer's retreat. And I'll talk about this in a minute, but um, Gift from the Sea is celebrating its 65th anniversary of when the book was published. And if you haven't read the book, please read it. It's such a special, magical book. And Anne Marie Lindbergh wrote it when she was on the shores of Captiva after losing a child and having all sorts of, um, during that kidnapping and having all sorts of um, problems and she reflects on each of the shells and it's gorgeous. Anyway, there's a lot of inspiration to be found in Lee County, especially on Sanibel and Captiva. So we helped cultivate um, a writer's group that spent a weekend there writing their own books and screenplays and we wanna, we wanna make this a home of inspiration. So anyway, we're working on that. Oh, whoa, whoa. Sorry. And then in this run, we had a PR boot camp. We had 50 partners. We talked about what is PR, what can we do for you, how can we help you. Um, we have the, the whole presentation on video, so if you want it or you want to show it to your employees or you're interested, um, it has travel trends and what we're doing and how, how we as a VCB can help you with your PR needs. And it was really successful. We had breakouts. And one of the things that the people said consistently was they wish they could see themselves and their businesses more in local media. So I wanted to remind you, if you didn't know this, and in fact one came out today, that we are actually consistently in the news press and Florida Weekly every other week. Today's cover is this, Tam's column. And what's particularly extraordinary about it is look at the real estate on this paper. It's on this page. I mean, that's one column and it takes up three quarters of the page. So we have this kind of um, exposure in Florida Weekly and the News Press every other week. And we try to highlight our partners and our trends and make it interesting for the reader to, tell our, to keep telling our story about Lee County and who we are. Um, looking ahead, travel shows. Big week, like... Um, 
Joe was talking about, New York Times Travel Show, Jackie Parker will be there the night before, is something called in, uh, International Media Marketplace, which is like speed dating for media from around the world. It's, it's an ex exhausting day where every 15 minutes you face a new media and you tell them they, what they want from you and what you want to tell them. Um, she's also going to be doing a press conference. I don't know if you remember, but last year we did a press conference at the New York Times, but it was about Red Tide. So now we don't have to do a press conference about Red Tide. We're going to do it about road tripping, and we're going to share it with the Keys and Fort Lauderdale, and we're going to talk about how you can come here, um, travel here by a car, because it's a huge trend right now to road trip, and you want a road trip with your partner. So she'll be talking about that. Uh, with uh, the Keys and Fort Lauderdale. And then um, this month we're hosting the North American Travel Journalists Association, which is a really prestigious group of journalists, 16 of them, and they will be here as well. So this is the funnest thing that we will be doing. Um, there's a beer marketing and media mission. It's true, there really is a beer conference. It's the fourth annual beer conference because, uh, and Jackie Parker and Annie Banyan are gonna go on our behalf. And it's because beer is big. We have 12 breweries in Lee County, and it is an exploding, it's just an exploding tourism attraction. And in the old days, you could just have a brewery and you'd have triple digit increases, but now everybody's doing it. So, so Florida seventh ranks seventh or ninth in the country, ninth. Um, and so basically, the triple digits are going down. So now they want you to have a beer and something, like a beer and a tour, or a beer and trivia night, or a beer and, I don't know, something. So, pairings. <laughs> yeah, pairings. So Jackie and Annie are going to go there, and they're going to be meeting with DMOs and, and tour operators and media and marketing strategists and talk about how we can help align some of our marketing uh, expertise with our local breweries. Because there'll probably be more. And then lastly, I already told you about Gift from the Sea, but it's the 65th anniversary. We're going to do some. Waters has a cottage with Anne Merle Lindbergh's face on it called the Anne Merle Lindbergh Cottage. So we're going to just take, make use of this anniversary to showcase our beautiful destination, our shelling, um, and why people come here when, they're, when they want to heal or when they want to be inspired or when they want to write or when they just want to walk down the beach and think, have a clear thought in their mind. And then lastly, I want to show you my favorite page is our accolades, because these are sort of our freebies, just because what we do. We just, all of us in this room, do the goodwill, keep it going, share our stories, and they end up on lists. Four best beaches, seven great destinations. Um, and that's pretty much it. The other thing I forgot to tell you was we have a beer map. And I've got, a, I've got a, a pile of them over on this table. And so it's really cool, in case you have a whole go drinking, you can start <laughs> at Bradenton, and you can go all the way down to Naples, and it will tell you every single uh, craft, craft beer you can have, every brewing. There's some distilleries, and there's even a wine a winery on here. So there's a, a, a your own special map if you would like them. And that's something we did in partnership with all the CVBs on the West Coast, just to show how we part partner regionally. Yeah. But people who like this like to have the experience of you know different areas, so it was a great way for us to partner up. And we all print our own individually, and we have it digitally on our website. So, so we have these if you would like them. And that is it. If anyone has any questions, I'm done. All right. Thank you, Francesca. Very good. And does that conclude the executive director's report? It does. Very good. All right. Well, we will move on. Any questions for our executive director before we move on? No? Fantastic work. I, I love seeing, you know, all of it, from PR to sales, everything. Um, all right. So let's move on to the new business. We uh, have a presentation this morning from the city of Sanibel on the emergency Sanibel Captiva erosion protection project. Uh, so let's call up the folks from Sanibel to make that presentation. Good morning and Happy New Year, Mr. Chairman, members of the TDC. My name is Judy Zamomra and I serve as the City Manager of Sanibel. In addition to myself, with us this morning of Sanibel are the Mayor of Sanibel, former long-tenured member of the TDC, Kevin Ruane, 
former TDC member, Sanibel Councilwoman Holly Smith, who also serves as our city council current liaison to TDC. James Evans, biologist, city of Sanibel, director of natural resources. Keith Williams, PE, city of Sanibel, director of community services and our city engineer. Steve Shapel, CPA, city of Sanibel, director of finance. And John Agnew, city attorney, city of Sanibel. We have left at each of you, for each of you at your seat, a packet which has been placed at your seat with additional supporting materials for our request today. Over the 19 years that I have been serving as city manager of Sanibel and almost every month attending these meetings, I can honestly state that we have forged together a very strong partnership between TDC and your members, the county, and the city of Sanibel as a partnership that has yielded great returns for each of us. Together, we have promoted, protected, and maintained our beaches by world-class standards as a most desirable destination globally. On the left side of your packet is a list of the prestigious recognitions bestowed upon our destination based upon the quality of our beaches on Sanibel. On the right side of your packet are four items. The City of Sanibel's Declaration of Emergency, which brings us to, before you today for this urgent out-of-cycle request. Also, there's two news articles. I know the tenured members of TDC will recall that funding shoreline stabilization and fortification projects, such as this request, even when out of cycle, is not a unique investment of TDC funds. Attached are two similar examples of previously funded TDC projects. The final item, item in your packet is the PowerPoint presentation Director Evans will make to you in just a moment. Following Director Evans' presentation, the City of Sanibel Mayor Kevin Ruane will also speak. On behalf of us all, thank you for your time, your consideration, and most importantly, our partnership. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the Council. I'm James Evans, Director of Natural Resources. I'm very pleased to be here today talking about our beach and shoreline project rather than water quality. We're having a very good year. You can go out onto our beaches, uh, at, whether it's Sanibel, Captiva, Fort Myers Beach, or other beaches throughout the county, and you can see the water quality right now is pretty tremendous. So very pleased to be here for a beach and shoreline project. So the city of Sanibel is here today uh, to request $1.4 million in uh, emergency funding for erosion, uh, beach and shoreline erosion. Uh, this is a very urgent project um, that is along northern Sanibel, uh, adjacent to Blind Pass, just south of Captiva Island. And this project is a partnership project between the city of Sanibel, Lee County, and Captiva Island. Um, as you all know, um, we are partners in managing Blind Pass. And Blind Pass, um, here's the project area. Let me just go through this really quickly. You'll see the yellow star indicates the project area. Uh, it's located on northern Sanibel, or what some refer to as, as the western end of the island, uh, adjacent to Blind Pass. These are some recent photos that were taken in November, on November 22nd of 2019, following one of the first um, severe cold fronts that we experienced on Sanibel Island. And you'll notice um, that this is a uh, public, public accessible location to the beach. Um, you'll, you'll notice in the upper left-hand photo, there is a, an access point adjacent to the guardrail. Uh, the photo to the right, uh, upper right, shows you some signage, some educational signage as well as a bike rack. We also have refuse containers in this area uh, that allow people visiting the beaches, whether they're um, grabbing a meal across the street at the Sunset Grill uh, or the Lazy Flamingo or staying at the adjacent accommodations um, at Castaways, they can access this beach. Uh, and, and actually, it is a um, great location to access uh, Silver Key on, on northern Sanibel Island. And you'll notice there is an old wooden seawall in the lower left here. Let me show you here. Old wooden seawall sea wall that was constructed in the 1950s, uh, 1960s to protect uh, the property along here as well as uh, Castaways Resort. And that yellow arrow is really just pointing out the proximity of the erosion, the escarpment, that vertical cliff of sand here, and the proximity to the um, edge of pavement for Sanibel Captiva Road. This is an updated uh, 
survey that was done December 5th, uh, 2019, uh, and you can see um, it, it moved, uh, moved towards the road a little bit here in this location, um, but generally it's been somewhat stable for the last, uh, for, for a couple weeks. This is an aerial photograph uh, taken by our uh, engineers at Humiston and Moore, and you can see the project area here, uh, the old wooden seawall, castaways here, lazy flamingo, and this is the um, Sunset Grill. And you can see the area of concern is this area here, this beach and shoreline area here um, that's, that's heavily used uh, by tourists uh, in the area along northern Sanibel. Again, here's another view um, perspective uh, flown by drone. And I just want to provide a little project history. So this um, area was designated as a Lee County critical erosion area. Uh, we have maps going back to the 2000s. Uh, because uh, this is a, an area that's been identified as a critical erosion area, uh, we work with the DEP, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, as well as Lee County, uh, to manage this portion of the beach to make sure that uh, it's protected uh, through the Blind Pass Inland Management Plan, as well as um, through the Captiva Erosion um, Renourishment Projects. Um, we renourish the stretch of beach. And through 20, 2015, um, we have placed um, large amounts of sand in this location, and we have bypassed sand from the Blind Pass Inland Management um, dredging into this area to protect this shoreline. This erosion is strongly influenced by management of Blind Pass Inland Management Plan, as identified by the, by the county's engineers uh, during the inland management study. Uh, which was incorporated into the inland management plan. It's also influenced by the rock groin uh, or jetty on Captiva Island. We get downdrift erosion, that shadowing effect from the structure. Uh, downdrift of the hardened structure, you tend to get erosion. And that's what we've been working with and been dealing with for, um, for decades now. And the beach renourishment history, uh, Captiva has done and conducted a number of beach renourishments in this area. Um, the blind pass dredging, again, has bypassed sand from the inlet. Uh, into this area and of course this is a dynamic portion of the beach and because of the changes and the way the system is set up um, it is a critical erosion area and there is a lot of pressure uh, in that area but one of the things that made this um, really somewhat of an urgent matter is that Hurricane Michael that passed through our area that went up the Gulf Coast um, in October of 2018 and impacted Mexico Beach we entered the, the winter season with a, a deficit in the sand budget. What that means is normally during the summer, our beaches are accreting or gathering sand, and the sand is moving from south to north along Sanibel's beaches. During the winter months, we generally get really strong north-northwest winds that drive along that shoreline and tend to erode or remove sand from our beaches. So what, what, Hurricane, um, what Hurricane Michael did was it took away sand from this critical area as it passed by, and we weren't able to recoup or recover that sand prior to the winter cold fronts coming in in earnest in November and December and through the winter season. So that left us with a deficit in the sand budget that was never recovered to date. And the city began design work on an emergency project in May of 2019 because of this fact. Uh, we found that um, because that sand wasn't recovered and because of the proximity to the Sanibel Captiva Road, that this beach and shoreline needed to be recovered uh, in a way um, that would give us some long-term stability and some resiliency along the roadway. While we were doing our planning, we also felt the need that with rising seas, there are incremental rising sea levels, that we would design a project that could be, um, that could be adaptable uh, to make it more resilient in this stretch of the, um, stretch of the island. So um, this was designed with that in mind. Uh, we've submitted a, a, a permit to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection in July. Uh, it was submitted July, uh, July 16th, 2019. Uh, that was reviewed and the um, permit is ready to be issued. However, we were advised by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection that if we needed to take short-term measures um, because of our procurement process, it normally takes anywhere from 60 to 90 days to bid out a project, they advised us that if we needed to take emergency measures, that we'd need to do that before the permit was issued. So that is why we decided, uh, and I'll walk you through that, that is why the, we decided the city of Sanibel needed to take some emergency measures and declare a local state of emergency. This is the uh, project area you can see by this arrow pointing to the uh, critical erosion area here identified on the Lee County critical erosion map. And this is dated January 1st, 2000. 
This is a uh, this is a, a design that was uh, that was put together by Dex Benner and Associates for the Lee County uh, Department of Transportation. Um, there were concerns back in, in 1991. Uh, where the erosion was occurring. There was an old home uh, that existed in this area that had to be condemned and removed. Uh, this per the, the land was later acquired by the city of Sanibel. Uh, and this revetment was actually designed by the Lee County Department of Transportation to help protect that shoreline. As far as I know, and as far as the engineers in our, um, at the city of Sanibel, as well as uh, the folks we've talked to with Lee County Natural Resources and DOT, only a portion of this revetment was actually constructed in this area here. The whole shore was actually not constructed. Uh, and it looks like, based on the way it was constructed, is actually closer to uh, the edge of pavement of, of the roadway, uh, and that this, this is fully exposed at this point. And this shows you um, a profile view of that rock structure. These aerials show you a comparison from September 2017 to August 21st, 2018. Uh, and you can see from 2017 to 2018, there's a significant change in the shoreline here. And you can see the influence of the rock growing structure uh, on, from Captiva on, on this area here, as well as how we manage the pass in an open state. And we have all agreed, um, whether it's Lee County, Captiva and Sanibel Island, I think we all feel that from a tourism standpoint, it's in all of our best interest to maintain the blind pass in an open state, not only to protect the property values of the properties along Captiva here, but also to provide that recreational resource. If this were one island, um, you wouldn't have those same recreational benefits. You wouldn't have the world-class fishing that occurs in Blind Pass uh, and the boating opportunities with small boats that go in and out of this pass. Not to mention the water quality benefits of having that flushing from the Gulf of Mexico into Blind Pass, into Pine Island, um, that provide many benefits, uh, as you all know. Again, some more aerial photographs um, looking uh, this view here. Um, looking south, this view here, looking north. And you can see the historic old wooden wall that was constructed back in the 1950s into the 60s, uh, and you can see the castaway cottages here. Our engineers advised us that if this wooden seawall weren't here, uh, the erosional pressure here would have probably taken out at least one of these cottages. So they've advised us to leave that in place, and that as we um, protect the shoreline here through renourishment, um, that that wooden seawall wouldn't be exposed. But that wooden seawall is also exacerbating the erosion um, to, the, to the north here, uh, or I'm sorry, to the south here, as the, the wave and wind action comes here, it's transported here, which is really putting a lot of pressure on that point. Again, here's another perspective of that old wooden seawall. What this, this uh, graphic here provides you a profile view of the sand loss uh, from, night, uh, from 2017, of September 2017 to September 2018. And you can see we've lost sand both vertically and horizontal. We've lost about, a, about 100 feet um, of loss um, of sand horizontally. And vertically, if you look here, is negative four up to about you know, four and a half feet, over eight, almost 10 feet of sand vertically along this portion of the shoreline. And you can see that with the bathymetric uh, images here that were provided by our coastal engineers. And so the, the city has uh, taken a number of different actions to date. Um, we've completed the design and engineering for the emergency um, protection measures. Uh, we've obtained permits from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. We've also adopted a resolution, uh, resolution 19-082, declaring a state of emergency so that we could take action on this project immediately um, to put sandbags in place, remove some vegetation that exists there today um, so that we can, we can protect that in the short term. We've also approved emergency funding for $38,450 to do that work. Uh, and we've pro um, put out a project um, bid that went out the 7th of January um, to, to begin that work or put the bid out so that we can um, solicit bids. Those bids are supposed to come in at the end of January. Those will be taken, um, the, the uh, low bid on that bid request will go to Sanibel City Council in their first week in February for approval. Uh, this is a timeline for the emergency protection project. We declared a state of emergency on the 19th of December. We mobilized contractors immediately. The vegetation work was completed last week, uh, and the sandbags will be placed um, between Monday and Tuesday of next week. The permanent project timeline, the permit would, it says it was issued on the 20th. The DEP was ready to issue that permit. Because of the holidays, they asked if they could wait till the first week in, uh, 
first or second week in January, we, we provided authorization for them to delay that in issuance until this week. So we should be receiving that permit this week. We should bid notice on the 7th. Contractor selection will be, um, will be completed prior to the council meeting. And we plan to mobilize the contractor the first week in um, March. And the project construction is estimated to be about 60 days. That's a pretty tight timeline, but our engineers uh, and the folks that they've talked to in the um, construction industry feel that that can be done. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection's permit says that it needs to be done before um, sea turtle nesting season. That's why we have the tight timeline. Emergency sandbag placement, um, you can see here um, along the shoreline, uh, we have uh, one and, and two rows of sandbags. Those will primarily be a uh, short-term stopgap measure uh, to protect the shoreline uh, in the short term until we get the project bid out, identify a contractor, and move forward with the permanent project. This is an example of what those sandbags look on a project that was done by our coastal engineers on Honeymoon Island, which is a state park uh, north, of, north of here. And you can see that this was, this, this was mainly used to shore up and protect the shoreline in the short term. This is a plan view of the permanent project. But if you look at the beach renourishment trigger here that we've set up, this is uh, essentially, I think it's easier to see from this perspective. It's about 500 linear feet of, 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 sea, of, of wall that will be protecting the shoreline in this area. In front of that wall, the wall we anticipate will be constructed either using a technology called True Line, which is a vinyl uh, wall, uh, wall cell construction um, that, will be, that will be driven into the ground about 25 feet. In those cells, we will be putting uh, rebar, uh, steel. Well, actually, we're going to be using fiberglass so that it, it increases the longevity of the project in between those cells and then that will all be poured solid with concrete with a concrete cap on top of that wall. You can see that uh, in the image here. Uh, that be, can be changed or modified with changing seas, uh, sea levels. So that will help us make the project more adaptable for the long term. It's anticipated this project lifespan is about 50 years. So when you look at the, the cost of the project over the 50 years, um, we're looking at about $20,000 or $28,000 investment uh, each year for the next 50 years uh, for the total project cost. There'll be large rocks that will be placed in front of that. We, we refer to them as a riprap revetment. Um, that's a technical term for a rock wall uh, that will be in front of this, um, this vertical wall here. There will be a, a sand replacement trigger that when, the, when we get to a certain point along that wall, sand will need to be replaced immediately. And the goal is to have this project look like any other Sanibel beach. It looks like a natural beach with dune vegetation and sand uh, that, of course, supports the tourism-based economy that we have on our island today. So the goal isn't to allow this to look like a seawall uh, or a rock structure, but to look like a natural Sanibel beach that we will be required to put sand on once it meets that sand trigger. And so the impact on Lee County tourism, I know that's what we all care about here, um, and certainly that is something that is important and drives our economy here in Lee County. Uh, the, San, uh, this, the Sanibel Captiva Road, for one, provides uh, the only access way uh, to Captiva Island in northern Sanibel. Uh, and it provides access for the people that visit our islands uh, to access the accommodations, restaurants, and other places that our tourists, uh, tourists that come to our islands come to enjoy. It is the northernmost point of the city's shared use path. And as you all know, the city's shared use path has obtained gold status as a bike friendly community. And um, that's important because people that do bike out to Captiva, they want to access the beach. And they can access the beach either at Turner Beach, Blind Pass on Sanibel, or they can access this access point directly across from the Lazy Flamingo on Sunset Grill. Uh, it provides walkable public access to the beach and public amenities uh, that we provide there, um, including a bike rack, informational signage, and refuge disposal, as well as access to Silver Key, which is a very popular area for shelling uh, and watching shorebirds along the shoreline. And of course, if you go out there at any nighttime, you know, going into the evening during sunset, you'll see people lined up across this area of beach um, after they have dinner across the street at our uh, local accommodations. So, now, we think this is a very important project, and it does uh, provide direct public access to many of our beaches um, on Sanibel Island. And here are some photos that have been taken um, you know, over the last couple of years of people utilizing this stretch of beach. And you can see um, you know, we have sunbathers, um, families accessing the beach um, using this stretch of beach. Um, and we think it's a very important uh, economic driver for Sanibel Island. And with that, um, I know Mayor Wayne wants to come up and talk a little bit about the project as well.
Thanks, James. First and foremost, my name is Kevin Irwin. I'm the mayor of Sanibel. Been the mayor for the last 10 years, and certainly had the privilege of sitting on this board with many of you. I don't come here lightly, and certainly understand the task what we're asking for. Um, I think the most important thing that we look at is first and foremost, have we been here before on such a request? We have. I've sat on this table and actually made the motion back when the Gasparilla uh, Resort actually had a uh, state project that I would look for out of cycle for funding. Kusachi Regional Project Park actually did the same exact thing. So when we look at the request, it's not on abnormal. Secondarily, um, I've sat down here with many of you, gone through the necessary um, shoreline allocations, the money that's set aside. Sanibel and Captiva together, um, there's not a stronger economic driver uh, to contribute bed tax to you. We have the full support of Captiva, as many of you may or may not know. We certainly, through many interlocal agreements, really take care of a lot of the needs and necessity for Captiva. Really what I'm asking for today is your consideration. It's really to fund this project. We're looking at this as a long-term solution. Okay, we continue to come here and we look at situations as a long-term investment. This is no different than a capital investment that we'd be before you making. No different than the bathrooms we talked about. And as you can tell, Sanibel has always done it in a very unique way. We want to obviously protect the environment. The environment is good, and as James had indicated, we need to have a, this project done by May 1st. Obviously, the turtle season is one that's important. Good news and bad news. The good news is that obviously the people come for that particular reason. It's why they pay the bed tax they do. They come to the particular area. So that is obviously something we're faced with. As a mayor, having called many emergencies, they all seem to be around water. This is no different. This is a situation that obviously is dire and is really important for us to do so. Um, the last thing that I would certainly cover, and most importantly, is just indicate that we're in a position, I'm not asking and coming here, where you don't have the access funds. I've sat here and most of you know me as a bean counter. There's certainly adequate funds in Beach and Shoreline Reserves to do that. Many times as we went through the projects in the past, where there was excess money left over, I think there was only one year I sat up here where there wasn't money to fund all the projects. Most of the times that was actually put in reserves. I know the reserves are made more than plentiful and certainly there. It's just really a consideration that I'd like you to do. Um, it's an investment that Santa will continue to update you on. It's an investment I think is necessary. Some other th key things that you may want to consider on top of this being a long-term project. We're going to have to obviously work with LCEC. We've talked to them about moving um, actually the pole and the necessary uh, uh, re-establishing of that in a different area. So there's many different parts that we have to coordinate and do. We're up to the task and obviously as everyone's indicated, the timeline is really, really short. Um, that's my uh, request, and certainly I appreciate your consideration in our request. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Council, what questions do we have for the team from Santa Bell? Okay, Mr. Wells? Uh, I guess I'll start out. I'm assuming that you sought uh, financial support from other entities, organizations. Uh, how's that worked in the past? How much of this falls on the state? Uh, who, who maintains the road? Is that county or state? The road is a county road maintained through an interlocal agreement by the city of Sanibel. Thank you. And I would add, we, um, the city of Sanibel did apply for funding through the Florida Department of Environmental Protection shoreline uh, project requests. Uh, however, um, that project wasn't, um, didn't make the cut. So we didn't, um, we didn't get funding through that program. What other questions or discussion do we Can I make a motion? Yes, Ms. Meyer. Move forward, put this on the table. Obviously, it's a major, major emergency project. I think they did an excellent job in the explanations this morning. I think we all understand. So I, I will make that motion. Second. Okay, so we have a motion for approval from Fran Myers and a second from Pam Cronin. Um, can I just, for clarification of your motion, I'm going to be supportive of it too, but so is this to, uh, is this to forward it on to the Board of County Commissioners with a recommendation that we look at approving this project and this request by Santa Bell? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, very good. So what discussion do we have on the motion? Just a Councilman question. McLean. Being new on this board. Uh, is there other funding within Lee County that we could uh, take some funds also, or does it all have to come from the TDC? Does our county manager want to take a stab at that one? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The 
all the capital dollars that are available to us for uh, whether it's this kind of a shoreline um, project or any of our road projects, all of those dollars ha are allocated over, you know, for the foreseeable future. So we really don't have a funding source other than um, the one that's being uh, considered today. You know, we have, you, you, we, we have adequate reserves in, in the bed tax funds, uh, all three of them, uh, plus the undesignated reserves. I think even in the undesignated reserves, there's about $14 million. And that's really what it's there for. Um, there's no reason to collect the dollars if not to be spent on whether it's marketing or the other, any of the other categories. Um, but in an emergency like this, this is a perfectly appropriate fund of, uh, source of funds uh, for this project. Ms. D. Pasquale. Just to clarify that this money would come from the undeclared reserves versus affecting this year's line requests, right? We wouldn't consider this part of that number that we would be. Mr. Chair? Yeah, go ahead. Lynn? Colleen, uh, we would use the remaining balance for unallocated beach and shoreline, which is about 613000 okay. The remainder uh, would then be funded by the common reserve. Okay. And it wouldn't affect this year's any requests we've no. this year? No. Right? We've already made those allocations. Perfect. Okay. I mean, we're going we're to do this process again, right, like we do every year? Yes. Yeah, okay. It's just they, they need this fiscal year funding versus the coming. Yeah. It has no impact on any of the current spending. Excellent. That's a great question. Mr. Wells? Uh, obviously, this is hugely important. I mean, you have to protect the road that's getting all the tourists to these critical areas. Um, I have no problem supporting this other than I, I, I do feel like a lot of this has fallen on, on, the, on the money that's in the reserves. I, I understand your thought that it's, it's appropriate, and I, I would agree that, that it um, is and and again I'll support it. I just think it's unfortunate that there weren't some other key players um, involved in in supporting this as well with their finances from somewhere um, because it, it is a big ask. But um, again, I I would support it. I, I if you're ever going to have reserves, if you're ever going to use them for something, um, protecting Captiva and Sanibel and um, and the tourism related to that is of utmost importance. Excellent. Oh, Mr. Cranley? Are we, um, are we um, funding 100% of the project? Is that the recommendation uh, that goes along with your motion? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. And let me ask, Roger, we can do that? We, um, we, we research this uh, thoroughly, and I'm going to ask um, Andrea to give her a quick legal opinion. But we believe that it's within a small fraction of 100 percent. Is that, Andrew, if I said that correctly? That is correct. There are a couple of items that we've already discussed that will not be funded through TDC um, or TDT funding, but everything else for uh, shoreline protection and erosion control will be funded uh, through TD TDC dollars. And when I say a small fraction, I'm talking, you know, thousands of dollars, you know, and a few. Very good. Mr. Come back Lane. again. Uh, I'm in support of this project for sure because it's an emergency and it needs to be done and I think it's important for a continuation of tax dollars. But we do have an ongoing problem that lurks out there of rising seas and the like. <coughs> it seems to me that we should not be, TDC should not in future endeavors be the source for this kind of funding. It seems like that should be budgeted elsewhere, if I'm not mistaken, in, throughout the county. I mean, if, if seas continue to rise, we're going to see erosion of beaches, potentially highways and the like. Where else will this funding potentially come from in, in the future? Go ahead, Rich. That's a really broad um, statement and conversation. Um, the, I, think, I think the short answer is um, where this project is concerned, given the nature of the emergency and the fact that the way Sanibel has designed this, this project to be a long-term capital investment, I think it answers some of that question immediately for this section of the shoreline. When we talk about um, sea level rise otherwise, you know, the governor's office has uh, just this year created the office of 
But there's a bill right now that's going to go up in front of the legislature this year for the Office of Resiliency. Thank you. Yeah, and and with it being a, a priority of the governor, I assume it's going to pass. Uh, you know, of course, there'll be an interesting debate in the legislature. Uh, and, and I think that's really the organization that we ought to follow the lead of going forward when we talk about things like sea level rise. Um, there's also a, a bill uh, in the legislature this year from our own local uh, member, Ray Rodriguez, who, uh, who's talking about um, how do we handle public infrastructure and potential impacts from sea level rise. And that has actually been moved under the uh, governor's office of resiliency once that gets created. So it'll be interesting. Um, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. I don't think this should be the sole source of funds to answer any future resiliency sea level rise issues that could potentially happen. However, beach and shoreline protection is actually one of the allowable expenditures for TDT dollars. Uh, you know, obviously marketing carries, carries the big weight. I mean, that's that's what we spend the majority of our dollars on, but we do uh, make allocations for beaches. And Mr. Chair, yeah. uh, it may also add, please, um, that we've been in the coastal protection business for many, many years. Um, we have, we, I mean, it's not just in partnership with the city of Sanibel, the town of Fort Myers Beach and others. Um, the federal government's involved, the state government's involved. We have some really far-reaching um, partnerships. Um, and within some of those partnerships, there are dollars associated uh, as well. So, you know, that's, um, you know, that's been a long-term issue for us. And I think that ultimately, depending on what the governor does uh, and, what, and what happens in the legislature, um, there will likely be, you know, state, perhaps federal dollars to, to help with you know, whatever projects come our way as it comes to sea level rise, but um, I, I, I feel pretty comfortable in saying, you know, it's not going to be bed tax dollars. They're going to fund the whole thing. I just just can't see that happening. Very good. Mr. Wells? Uh, <coughs> I, oh, and I, I missed Mayor Saraceda. No, it's okay. Go ahead, Ralph. After you. Uh, this is sort of on that same beach and shoreline discussion. We've been using numbers... Um, from prior emergencies that we've had, which have been considerably lower than this when, when making our assumptions based on the reserves that we need to have. Um, so I think it'll be a great conversation when we have that, that conversation about reserves. If you're taking a, a million four out versus uh, what maximum uh, reserve use for hurricane cleanup in the past has been a small fraction of that. Sure. Um, it puts into perspective this pot of money and also the importance of, of uh, properly vetting these beach and shoreline projects moving forward to make sure that we're continuing to save the kind of money that we might need for these kind of emergencies. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, J uh, Mayor uh, James, City Manager Zamamra, I, you know, just to sort of follow up on on Mr. Wells' comments, uh, I appreciate the presentation and the thoroughness of it to put us at ease with approving this, uh, this project. It was excellent. I always learn something from you, James, every time you speak. So thank you all very much. Mr. Kramer. So I, I support it as well, and I'm, I'm all for it. But I, I just want to make sure that we don't set a precedent for something and that we've covered all of our bases with it. And, um, in part of the packet that's been prepared, one of the things that's on it is the guidelines for beach and shore renourishment. And one of those guidelines was that the maximum of 50% for a project would be funded for beach and shoreline re renourishment. And so we're looking to approve 100% here. And so I'm wondering how that plays in. And then it's, it, it also states that it should be for the placement of sand and vegetation and no permanent structures. So does this provide permanent structures and this funding for this request? And I just want to make sure we know what we're saying yes to uh, for a precedent moving forward into the future on that. And I think that's a great question. It's one that I actually had as well. And so um, there is uh, an opportunity to waive that 50%, and we have actually used that in the past as well, if our yeah. staff could address that. Glenn? Mm, Mr. Chair, council members, I think... Uh, while this is an urgent funding request because of the timing and they do need funding this fiscal year, I think the mechanism by which you would actually consider this is simply an out-of-cycle beach and shoreline request. 
Um, so if it's something that you know you would consider under those terms, you can do the same thing here. Again, using the balance of the unallocated beach and shoreline dollars from this fiscal year. Now, granted, the remainder of the of the project would have to come out of the common reserve, but um, you have waived the 50%. If you want to say it's an emergency and waive the 50%, that has been done. There is precedent for that. But really, I think it's it's an out-of-cycle beach and shoreline project. Right. And, and so it sounds like the, the final, what we call it, whether we call it the emergency or whether we call it an out-of-cycle, those are things that we can actually, details we could work out before it comes to a full vote before the Board of County Commissioners then? Absolutely. Yes, sir. And I, uh, legal counsel is asking me to clarify, I think that you know, again, uh, this is very specifically for erosion protection, which is fully within your Bailey WIC. Um, anything that's road specific would not be eligible, but, you know, other than like, a cup, as the county manager said, other than maybe a guardrail that for $20,000, that kind of thing, these are eligible activities. Is that correct? Did I get that right? You are correct. Does that address the, as well, the permanent structure part of this that we're approving as well? I think it's almost semantics, right? Typically, a, a, an emergency project is just placing some emergency sand. This really is a complete project, right. which is why we think it should be considered an out-of-cycle request rather than an emergency project. And I think that's what we're talking about. That 50% has always been limited to just like, hey, there's a hot spot. We got to pour some sand in there, or else we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be in really bad shape. This is truly a complete project, a permitted project with, you know, all the, all the steps you would see in the normal beach and shoreline cycle. So to me, it's an out of cycle request over an emergency project. And in fairness, those are your guidelines. <laughs> They're, that's, that's your decision as, as a board, whether you want to change those guidelines, waive those guidelines, or it, it's not in stone, so to speak. I agree with her synopsis about. Yes. Okay. We are all in agreement. This is an out of cycle request okay. um, exclusively for beach renourishment and construction of the beach, which is in, um, which can be funded with TDT dollars. Awesome. Okay. So if I could ask the motion maker just to put a finer point on the motion so that everybody knows what we're going to vote on, and then I'll go ahead and call the vote. Uh, so, cycle. yeah. Mm -hmm. So the motion is for the Tourism Development Council to recommend to the Board of County Commissioners that they approve this out of cycle request for an erosion protection project. Right. Okay. And for just full a fund. point of clarification for, for my understanding, the normal guideline for funding on out of cycle is 100% or 50%? Well, on out of cycle, there's no uh, recommendation for 50, so it could so be. So you can fund whatever you want. Right. Okay. Okay, so the motion maker has made that motion, and the seconder uh, agrees. Okay, very good. All right, so we have a motion and a second on the floor. Mr. Wells? Speak after the vote, if you I'm want to speak after the vote? Okay, sure. Um, all right, then I'll go ahead and call the question. If there's no further discussion, then are there any objections? Okay, I see no objections, so the motion passes unanimously. And Mr. Wells? Go ahead. Um, that sort of came out, the history behind this is that um, when we would go to beach and shoreline, if we had a lot of out of cycle requests that weren't for emergencies, not for these kind of situations, that we, I think, and I don't want to speak for everybody else here, but I started to frown upon those because I thought that it took the fairness away from everybody else that was presenting. And then as the funds uh, were not enough to cover all of the projects requested, then you, you'd wonder, is that fair if somebody gets a jump on the, the, for the meeting and, and starts making these requests? So um, I think at this point, we've only granted these when they've been situations just like this, where they're definitely emergencies. Okay. That helps. Thank you. Thanks for I appreciate those comments. Thanks. Absolutely. All right, very good. Well, that, then thank you. I appreciate the board's consideration. Honestly, this out of cycle is not something we take lightly, and we appreciate your consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations, folks, and we'll see you at the commission meeting then. <laughs> Thank you.
All right. Uh, the next item under new business is uh, an easy item. I apologize. We have a Port Authority meeting, and I think I saw our Port Authority interim director here. There he is. Uh, he needs me at the same time you all need me for a TDC meeting. So we're going to shift the TDC meeting to the afternoon, if that's okay, on March 12th. And uh, we would just need the board's approval or the council's approval for that. Do we have uh, any discussion or would anybody make that motion for us? I'll make the motion. Okay, so we have a motion from Mr. Wells. Do we have second from Ms. Cronin? Any discussion on that? Okay, any objections to that? No objection, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you all, I appreciate it. Uh, and then for council information, uh, Tam, do you have any? There is a tourism trends report from U.S. Travel in your for council's information section of your packet. I highly recommend you take a look at that. Some real good information. Okay. That's all I have. Very good. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll just uh, share is uh, an item for me. I get a chance to make up to Sharon. I'm going to do a resolution at the January 21st board meeting recognizing Art Fest and all the wonderful things that it does for this area. So um, looking forward to that. And uh, at this point, let's move on to TDC member items. Mr. Wells, any items? Nothing for me. Thank you. Mr. Kramer? Uh, Florida Restaurant Lodging Association on January 30th will be holding a mixer at the Shangri-La Inn at, uh, in Benita. So if you want to come see what they've done to the Shangri-La, you can come there on January 30th from 5 to 7 p.m. Very good. And Ms. D. Pasquale? Nothing new today. Okay. Do we have anything from Ms. Myers? Um, just you have your notes in front of you from the airport and just a shout out and a thank you to Ben for keeping our airport well going and in, in great shape and kind of ignore what you hear on the television sometimes. Brian, you did a great job handling that the other day okay. on TV. So um, everything's great and we got, we're going gangbusters out there. So thank you, Ben. I'll pass. All right. And Mayor Saracita? I'm just looking forward to seeing what the December numbers are because I tell you what, you could not get on or off Fort Myers Beach yep. during the holidays. <laughs> there were so many, many people there. Um, we were very grateful for that, um, all the businesses, and I just really will look forward to seeing whether or not uh, these numbers match with the two-hour parade on Estero Boulevard. <laughs> so They're all in um, her stores. Yeah, that's right. They were all in my stores, thank God. And um, uh, it was, it, was a, it was a wonderful holiday season for Fort Myers Beach. Mm -hmm. That's great news. Okay. And Ms. Crone? Yeah, All right, looking forward to riding the carousel at the Shell Factory. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Everyone come out ride my 1927 carousel. So is it going? To. Is it already going? Yeah. It's already going. Two weeks now. Oh, 3,000 rides already. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. All right. <laughs> if there's no other business before us, then we'll go ahead and adjourn. Thank you all. Thank you.